Welcome to Monday Night in Prophecy. As always, I like to start with scripture, and I'm referring this time to Amir Sarfati, who said, The world hopes things will change, but their hope has no anchor, no reason to expect things to change other than humanity changing them. Our hope is not in or of this world, but in our soon coming King, our King who is worthy of all our praises. How true is that? We are waiting for the King. Yes, things will change, but unfortunately they'll change for the worse and not for the better. But we're waiting for the King. And when He comes, He will take us up in the rapture and there will be a glorious meeting in the air. Well, I had the wonderful privilege of going to Europe with my children and uh, my wife and um, our grandchildren. What a pleasure, what a great trip it was, how much we saw. Uh, it was absolutely wonderful. And I purposely went to places that relate to prophecy, Bible prophecy. And I'd like to show you those. We landed in Zurich. And in Zurich, we uh, went to the Limmat River. It's a large river going right through the center of Zurich. And very few Zurich people would know about that. Um, but there is a special place. And that special place I want to show you right now. So we are in Zurich and this is the Limmat River, beautiful river that leads into the lake just down below. There's a famous bridge here that goes all the way back to the 1300s. But something very special happened right here in this very spot. And uh, there was a, a man by the name of Felix Muntz. And Felix Muntz on January the 5th of 1527, so right around 500 years ago, had a dispute with the uh, reformer that was here at that time by the name of Zwingli. And Zwingli uh, wanted to stick to child or baby baptism, whereas uh, Felix Mons, he was an Anabaptist, would want to be, uh, have only baptizing people who are believers. So that was the dispute that went back and forth and so what happened after that is that they made a law uh, that stated that if you baptize a second time, you're guilty of death by drowning. Well, Felix Muntz had four brothers and they were the beginning of the Brethren movement and they baptized each other and Zwingli found out about it and with the soldiers went ahead and came to this very place took a boat out into the river uh, bound them with, uh, with uh, uh, strings and drowned them right here in the middle of the river now I want you to see a sign that most people probably don't realize but it's right here where it says right on this place in the middle of the river limit uh, they went on a small fishing boat and Felix Muntz and five others who were Teufel, that means uh, Anabaptists, in the Reformation time between 1527 and 1532 were drowned. And I'll tell you why this is important to us. And the reason why this is important to us is because in the book of Revelation chapter 20 verse 4 it reads this. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or on their hands. A time will come again when it is against the law by punishment by death, by beheading, uh, to believe and to follow Jesus. And that's the connection between this place right here and what the future holds for this world. 
There are other places too where there are similar stories and we'll get to that later on. Isn't that amazing? That just happened 500 years ago. Segment number two. I'm now taking you to Austria and not far from the city of Linz there's a place called Mauthausen. And Mauthausen was the largest concentration camp of Austria. 200,000 prisoners. Half of them dying. And that's where I made my next segment. Please watch. So we're here in the middle of a concentration camp. It's the largest concentration camp of Austria. Some 200,000 were captured here and kept in those barracks left and right. In one of those one bedroom there were like 300 they were body to body on the floor the soldiers were walking over them at night to control them about half of the 200,000 were killed and only half uh, uh, the other half 100,000 were then uh, freed when the Americans came and freed this concentration camp it was the last concentration camp of Europe that was freed and so it was a horrible scene as we walked through there and looked at the gas chambers and the ovens uh, just absolutely horrendous and again it reminds reminded me of the book of Revelation where it talks about that at the very end the heads will roll and so what they will do is they will gather the believers and put them in camps like that and who knows maybe even this camp might be used again one day in the seven years of tribulation towards the end when people will be captured and uh, killed for the name of Jesus and so this is how that can relate for the future, in the not too far future, when those things will happen according to the book of Revelation, the last few chapters. That's where we are today. Segment number three. There's a statue on the Ringstrasse, the ring, the belt that goes around the inner Vienna, uh, inner city. And right there along this beltway, there's a huge statue of a man by the, by the name of Dr. Karl Luger, who lived years before Hitler, but there is a connection. And so, but that's not uh, all I want to show you, but let's start with that. So we are right downtown Vienna right now. This is a little park and the statue that you just saw is from Dr. Luega. Karl Luega was the mayor of Vienna and he was loved. That was before uh, Hitler came into power. He had great influence on Hitler because he was anti-Semitic. He hated the Jews and did whatever he could against the Jews. Now, as you watch, there is some graffiti on it, and it says Schande right here on the bottom. And what that Schande means is shame. So there are some pro Jews that uh, put that up there to show their opposition to the anti Semite of Dr. Luger. But that's not what I want to show you here. We're going to walk down towards the end of the park. And I'm going to show you something that 99.9% .9 of all Viennese have no idea about. So, follow me. In the next segment, I want to take you to the back of this statue. Further back of this little plaza with a lot of trees, very pretty. But again, there is a tiny sign a monument to what happened there and that's what I want to show you in segment number four so I walked to the back of this plaza the Dr. Luega Plaza and, and this is old Vienna you see the walls around the uh, Vienna there were double walls. The Turks tried twice to take it and couldn't. And in the middle you have the St. Stephen's Cathedral. 
and uh, they defended it against the enemy. Now I want you to look over here because that's the remainder of the wall. They left that on purpose just to show where the wall was. But that's not the important thing. Let me show you the important thing right over here. Come with me. So in the early 1500s, there was a name, a man by the name of Dr. Balthasar Hubmeier. And Hubmeier was one of the leaders of the Anabaptist movement. He had a discussion uh, with Swingley in Zurich. He was living in Zurich. He had a discussion. They were both doctors and so they uh, disagreed on the baptism, matter of baptism. And so what happened was that uh, Balthasar Hubmeier asked for a official discussion with, with the court with it to see who is right according to the Bible. Is it baby baptism or is it believer's baptism? And he proved from the Bible that it is believer's baptism. However, most of the people in Zurich at that time were already heavily influenced by Swingley and they voted against him. So they took him and put him on the stretcher where they, they pulled the, the, the bones apart and it was unbelievably painful. And so what happened was he recant in this painful situation. He says, okay, okay, I, I take it back, I take it back. Well, he's, they said, okay, fine, but you have to leave the city. He left the city and felt so bad about his decision that he made that he says, I, I'm, I'm not going to recant. I can't. I can't become a liar to what I believe the Bible teaches. And so what happened next was that he went in an area where he thought he was safe, but he wasn't because of the, the Austrian empire, empire. And the emperor who was in charge knew he was there, had his soldiers come, take him to a castle just outside of Vienna along the Danube River, and that's where he stayed for quite a while, until this date right here. The 10th is the month, the 3rd is the day of 1528. What happened on, on that day, they took him from the castle, they brought him here, right to this wall, right where we are here, and they burned him on the stake. His wife was standing right there with him, and he, she was encouraging he, uh, him and said, don't give up, don't give up, we believe in Jesus, we know that this is the truth. As he burned and died, two days later, they took her and drowned her in the Danube River. And that's what uh, Austrians don't know and don't understand. Uh, but, right here, this sign is proof of what happened in 1528. Segment number five has to do with an empress of the Austrian Empire, which was huge at that time. It included all the surrounding countries. Her name was Maria Theresia. She was the only woman that ever had that title of Empress of Austria. She was a cruel woman because she would not tolerate anything beside Catholicism. If you were not Catholic, you did not have a long life. Let's go ahead and watch that together. What you just saw here is one of the largest museums of all of Austria. And there's another one just like it on the other side. But that's not why we're here. We're here because of this statue. The statue behind me is the statue of the only woman that ever ruled as the Empress of Austria, of the greater Austrian Empire. Uh, half of Europe was under her rulership. And her name was Maria Theresia. She was well liked, but she uh, ruled with an iron hand. Uh, and the reason why I am uh, taking you to this statue, that in her rule between 1740 and 1780, she would persecute anybody that was not Catholic. Catholic was the only accepted religion. And anybody else would either have to run for their life there were thousands, tens of thousands of Lutherans who had to go hide in the Alps 
to get away from her, from an, uh, from her uh, uh, going after them, and or you would be killed. And under her rulership, literally thousands of Anabaptists, Lutherans, or anything else but Catholic would be unacceptable. And those people were literally killed, many by drowning, many by burning. And so while this is a beautiful statue, to know the truth behind it is pretty gruesome. The next segment I'd like to show you is the beautiful Blue Danube. A beautiful river that was cleaned up years ago and that is truly nice and clear and winds down through Austria. And as peaceful as it might seem, something very, very cruel happened here again in those years, 500 years ago, until about 200 years ago. And uh, so that's the segment I like to show you now. Watch. So we're standing at the Blue Danube, a beautiful river, boats, ships going up and down, a very picturesque, very peaceful, very quiet. But it wasn't always that way. There was a time when very bad things happened here. And as a matter of fact, over hundreds of years, there was no tolerance of religion. And so what happened here was if you were not Catholic, if you were an Anabaptist or anything else, they would say, change your mind. And if you say, no, you don't, they bring you here to the Danube. I don't know the exact spot, but somewhere along the Danube, they built like a, a, a Tidathala. And, and so what they do is they put a basket on it and they dump you down in the water. And until you're almost dead and then they pull you up. If you had a family, they would take the whole family here to the side of the Danube. The children would be the first ones in the basket. They let them down in the water until they are almost drowned. Pull them up and they talk to the father and say, will you recant? Will you change your mind? No? Okay, down again. This time the children drown. Next, the wife. She goes in the basket. The same thing happens. It is let down in the water. Will you recant? Pull her up before she dies. Change your mind? No? Down drown her and then finally the father would be drowned. Literally hundreds of people were drowned that way in the Danube River at that time. It wasn't until 200 years ago, a little more than 200 years, that there was freedom of religion declared and you could actually be an Anabaptist, you could actually declare to be a Brethren or, or a, a Mennonite or a Baptist or whatever and, and stay alive because the law was changed. And so while this looks wonderful and peaceful, that's not the way it was for hundreds of years. In segment, segment number seven, I'm showing you the Hofburg, which is the winter residence of the Habsburg dynasty. This is downtown Vienna, right along the Beltway, once again, the Ringstrasse. And the significance of this place, not just for the Habsburgs, but for something that happened much later. Let's watch. All right, now we are on a different place in Vienna. This is the Hofburg, which is the winter residence of the Habsburg dynasty, the emperor. Uh, he was living here in this huge palace right behind me and what you see is only part of it. It is absolutely magnificent. And generation after generation ruled Europe from here because Austria uh, included parts of Italy and the old Czechoslovakia and the old Yugoslavia and, and Hungary and uh, Bavaria and part of Italy, all of that was the Austrian Empire. It was humongous. But something else happened here. 
and what happened here on a certain day and that was March the 15th of 1938 and on March the 15th of 1938 Hitler came to Vienna it was called the Anschluss that is to connect with the German Reich and right over here my mom was standing or maybe she was standing here or maybe she was wherever she was standing right there on this plaza she was uh, in her early 20s together with 200,000 Viennese and on that balcony right behind me that's where Hitler was speaking from and the 200,000 people on the plaza yelled and they said we want to hear our Führer we want to hear our fear over and over and Hitler was marching back and forth on the balcony until they stopped yelling and then he began his speech little did they know what Hitler was planning to do they had no idea they wanted that there was progress like there was in Germany new autobahns new buildings work for the people and he did deliver very little did they know about what, how, how he thought about the Jews and what his plans were for the Jews. In Vienna alone, about nine-tenths of all Jews died and only about a tenth of them is left in an area that is protected by police because even to this day there is so much anti-Semitism going on, not just in Austria but all over Europe. And that's the reason why there are so many Jews going back to the homeland. It's too dangerous. Do you know what Heil Hitler means? It means salvation comes through Hitler. Salvation! That's what they were yelling. That's what they believed. He's our savior. He will save Europe. Until they were sorely disappointed when they saw what it was all about. Every third house in Vienna was destroyed by the bombs of the planes that came over Vienna. Many people died, even more after the war than in the war, because there was no food. The men were gone that would uh, work on the fields. Uh, the machinery was shipped to the front. The animals were shipped to the front. And the people home here starved literally to death. So that's the meaning of this place where Hitler was welcomed as a hero and that was the Anschluss. And finally segment number eight, the personal story of my father in Vienna. Let's watch that together. Vienna is a beautiful city of sculptures, of pictures and all kind of monuments but that's what I want to show you is right over here what you see behind me is the University of Vienna and that's the segment I want to close with today Vienna had a major role in the life of my parents and I'd like to share that story in just a second please go ahead sorry that's no problem so my dad, when he was just a young man, went to this university. And when he went there for about a couple of years, he decided to quit, step out. He was studying religion. He was studying to become a pastor, like his father was, my grandfather. But after two years, he was totally disillusioned. You see, the professors in this university that teach religion, that teach the Bible, ripped the Bible to pieces. It's called the, the greater um, destruction. And that's exactly what they did. They destroyed the faith of my dad. And what happened was that uh, they taught, for instance, that the Bible, all the miracles are to be taken out. Take them out. Take out the, um, the birth of Jesus, miraculous birth of Jesus through Mary. Uh, take all of that stuff out because it never happened. If you do that, you have nothing left. You destroyed it. And that's exactly what happened with my dad. He walked away. He became a policeman for most of the rest of his life. 
and then immigrated uh, to first to Canada and then to the States, to Sebring. And something very interesting happened there. He became a tour guide and one day he had a terrible accident. He was helicoptered to Orlando and I took him up to Orlando. And as we were in Orlando, uh, I had an opportunity to talk, to talk to him about the Lord because the doctor told me he might not make it. He might die in that hospital. I went to my dad and I said, Dad, this might be it. You might not make it till tomorrow. And so what happened next was that I said, Dad, would you be open to accept the Lord Jesus as your personal savior? And he said, no, I can't do that. I, I have done much too much bad stuff in my life. I said, Dad, consider the two thieves on the cross beside Jesus. They were pretty bad, but one of them accepted Christ. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. Would you not want to pray the prayer of a sinner asking Jesus to forgive you and accept him into your life? And he said, yes, I do want to do that. And he prayed by himself the most beautiful prayer I ever heard my dad pray, asking the Lord to forgive him, ask him to come into his heart. Now, after that, he was released from the hospital and God gave him 10 more years before he actually went to be with the Lord. It all started right at this university where he walked away like the prodigal son, but came back to the father. And those were just some of the places that I visited, actually just a small portion of the many places I saw. But those had a special connection to biblical prophecy. I wanted you to see the connection between what happened so many years ago and what will happen in the near future. The Bible is clear. Antichrist will come for a period of seven years. He will be ruthless. He will kill Christians, those that have turned to Christ within the seven years, because we believers before the seven years start are gone. We will not see those things. Thank the Lord. And we will experience the glory in heaven while literally hell on earth will reign. So that concludes the first part of my presentation. I hope you uh, switch over to the second part and watch that as well. Thank you for watching.